is a way for you to be able to um, chat. There's a three dot ellipsis and it allows you to chat. Another way to do something is send me a text if you run into any issues. That's probably the easiest for some of you. Now you're going to know my number and so feel free to call or text me with anything. Uh, what's my number? There you go. I think that's my number. Um, so I just put that through if you run into any issues or if you get kicked out or anything. Um, Oh, it looks like we are streaming now on YouTube Live. That is great. I don't know how that happened, but miracles happen every day. Um, so welcome, everyone. It's so good to see you. Any questions or comments or anything that you have, um, please, again, feel free to text me at 612-381-7573 or utilize the chat feature here via Zoom. Christian's going to do this as a lecture style, but then he'll uh, pause for some time for questions. If you have any uh, questions or things you want to jump in and participate, um, either just on um, send me a little chat to say, I have something, <laughs> I'll unmute you. Um, or you can send your, your question via text or in the chat to me or your comment or anything. Um, does that sound okay? If you're visual, give me a thumbs up if, you're, if you can hear and it sounds okay. All right. <laughs> Thanks for forbearing with us, everybody. Uh, it's really good to see you. Let's begin this time that we have together in prayer. God, we are so grateful for technology and that it can allow us, whether from virtual backgrounded beaches or cabins up north or our homes or apartments or wherever we are, God, that we, A, are gathered with you and we are gathered with one another. So God, continue to encourage and challenge us, challenge us this morning and how we might be your people and your church. And just thank you for everyone gathered and for Christian and for this time that we have, for it's in your name that we live and move and also get to spend time growing together. Amen. All right, Christian, take it away. Um, please, please turn off all your audio. Okay, am I gonna be, so am I able to get that camera? You can um, look at this one? look at that one if you either one. Okay. They're both here for you. But you'll pick up the audio from that. Yep. All right. Okay. Hey, everybody. Good to see everybody. Normally, I love to say I love to start out with like "Good morning," and then you guys give me a good morning back. But you know, I, oh, I can see a couple of people giving me a good morning. All right, I appreciate that. You're in the spirit. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here. And we're going to get started together. Uh, let's see here. And we will start our slideshow. I think this will work. Lord willing. Yes, it looks like it's going to work. Okay. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody. It's good to be able to be here with you. Um, man, uh, I, first of all, thank you for tuning in. Uh, that's number one. I, this is so much fun to be able to just be able to come to you and talk to you and share with you um, uh, some of the things that you know we've been doing together. Uh, so I really appreciate you being here. Number two, obviously, please be patient with us. We're going to probably have little glitches here and there. We're trying to figure a lot of this technology out as we go. I want to give a serious shout out though to Sarah and Jess. They have been huge um, for us, uh, and so deeply, deeply appreciate them. Um, uh, and their kind of constant work. Of course, uh, all the staff has been like working overtime. I don't think I've ever seen Jeff work harder, um, though maybe he has. I mean, the guy's just a hardworking man. Um, so uh, we are together. This is, uh, I think we're in like week or session eight or nine or something like that on Christianity and the Silk Road. Um, and normally what I like to do as you, uh, those of you who have participated before is I, I tend to like to uh, remind you what we've done in the past, sort of last week, um, and to give you a chance, because we're obviously dealing with an awful lot of material. Um, uh, I've, I've passed out maps for you in the past. We will have some more map handouts. Actually, I'll try to make those available on the CCB site uh, next week, so you can have that material with you. I apologize, because I was going to set up kind of a new uh, map handout for this coming week, but uh, at least you'll be able to see it in front of you, the maps that I'm going to use. There's only really, I think, one, maybe two new ones. Um, but uh, so just in terms of our last couple of weeks, 
Um, we have here we go. All right. Uh, we have uh, been traveling along. So this is Christianity on the Silk Road, um, right? And the, the basic idea of this class um, is that uh, most people know, right, the gospel has been going, uh, the gospel starts out in Palestine, and then it begins to travel uh, west, effectively, right? Uh, we know the stories about Paul and others, so it goes up into Europe, but before it does that, it goes down into Africa. Well, at the very same time uh, that it's going west, it's going east. We just haven't known about that story, I would say, particularly among Western Christians. I'm going to pause you. Oh, got to pause. Hold on. I'm going to try to fix the sound here. Give me one second um, to do that for y'all. Okay, is this sound better like that? Is that th sound sound better? Can you thumbs up if that's that better? better? Okay, okay. we're right. going to actually do that then. Uh, and now we will continue with this. There you go. Perfect. And then um, uh, from current slide. There you go. Boom. All right. So uh, wherever I was, uh, we were going east, we were going west, west and east, east and west. Anyway. Uh, so uh, just to remind us, right, we have been traveling along um, and effectively we have engaged um, uh, a, a significant sort of geographical area. We've talked about um, major sort of sites. Uh, I introduced you to the towns of Edessa, Arbella, Anisibus, uh, eventually uh, Seleucia Stesiphon. Then we talked about early figures, including Ephraim the Syrian, Ephrahat the Persian, among others. Um, and then I began to move us towards major events that wound up shaping um, this community and turning it into, um, uh, or, or really events that led to it congealing and becoming um, a church with a discernible identity, which came to be called the Church of the East. A couple of those events were the great persecution that happened in the fourth century, which lasted about 40 years, or excuse me, 60 years or so, um, under the auspices of the Persian uh, state um, with some certain uh, in, uh, input from powerful religious figures, Zoroastrian religious figures as well. And then in the fifth century, the church, uh, the Christians in this region began to come together, coalesced, created their own um, uh, kind of recognizable institution, declared the bishop at Seleucia Stesiphon to be independent um, in order in part to, I think, assure Persian authorities that uh, Christians may share the faith of others in the Roman Empire, but they're not necessarily disloyal citizens. Um, we then have done some pivoting. So the, the idea in the most of those uh, sessions that we've had together is the coming together, um, the coalescing, the creation of a, of a, a new church community, uh, which begins basically in the beginning of the fifth century. By the end of the fifth century, that one church community has fractured, if you remember, into three church communities because of disagreements over um, uh, about, about Jesus, basically. It's uh, over the council, the council of Chalcedon and the Chalcedonian definition. So we talked through some of that stuff. I don't wanna get too dragged down in those. Um, and then I told you basically that the seventh century was probably one of the most um, pivotal moments in terms of the story that we're talking about and the tradition that we're interested in. Um, and what I meant by that, of course, was the fact that this is the century, the seventh century is when Christianity first makes its way up into China. We haven't told that story just yet. But the second uh, major issue is the rise of Islam and the ways in which that produced a new sort of set of challenges and a new kind of religious interlocutor that Christians were going to have to deal with. We spent some time talking uh, then. Now, I think we're kind of getting close now to uh, where we were. We spent some time talking about Christian responses, uh, early Christian responses to Islam, particularly in Greek and Syriac. Uh, last week, 
there were two figures or two texts that we, or not last week, I guess two weeks ago, two figures that we had the opportunity to discuss. So the first was John of Damascus. Um, this is a figure who is actually very well known in the Western Greek speaking church, um, son of a, um, a I think sort of royal family uh, in the city of Damascus winds up working in the royal treasury, working for um, the the caliphate. Um, spoke Arabic. Um, eventually, under pressure, winds up leaving uh, to become a monk um, down in Palestine. He writes um, uh, a very significant uh, uh, work on um, I think it's on the, on the foundation of all knowledge or something like that. I can't remember actually the title, but there is a section, there's a middle section, if you remember, that was a refutation of heresies. And he, I think I told you that he, he catalogs 100 different heresies. The first 90 of them, he basically takes the work of another um, figure, a guy named Epiphanius, and just rewrites it, kind of just, uh, in the, we would call it plagiarism in the ancient world, they didn't. But then the last 10, his last 10 engagements, um, uh, become important because this is the place where he's making his own contribution. One of those, the very last one, is the way that John interprets Islam, and he interprets it as a as a for, as basically what he describes as a Christological heresy. And so I put that forward to you to see so that you can understand that um, Christians are trying to figure out well what is Islam? You know, they talk about God the Father, they talk about Jesus, they talk about the Word, they talk about Moses, etc. What is this movement? Um, and so there are some early Christians who are wrestling with this question and they are willing to contemplate, well, these are not necessarily outsiders. They are more than, more than likely they are insiders gone awry. So that's kind of the way that John, the, John of Damascus talked about them. The second text that we discussed, um, and I even provided for you um, some material uh, to look at, uh, some quotes, was we kind of made a pivot and so part of the part of what i wanted to um, offer for you to contemplate was the challenge um, that christians would have been faced with during this time to articulate their faith in a language which by the time they start to use it has become saturated with um, uh, associations of another religious tradition so what am i talking about i'm talking about arabic right so I talked about how Arabic um, as a language, it's a, it's a Semitic language. It certainly has a long history, but it doesn't really become codified in a sense until we get into the seventh century or so. Um, there's some evidence for just slightly earlier than that, but not much. Uh, so, but it's Christians who will start to write in Arabic to articulate their faith in the new context that they find themselves in. Um, and that really begins kind of in earnest in the 8th century, in the 700s. And the very first text that we have is an anonymous text called On the Threeness of the One God. And we discuss that text. Um, I, I try to draw attention to you uh, a number of areas. Obviously, the first thing to note, of course, is the title, right? So this is a text that deals with the doctrine of the Trinity. And that is is a area of uh, um, constant debate and disagreement between Christians and Muslims from the very beginning up to today. I would say all the way up to today, if you're going to have a discussion about what connects us and what divides us, some sort of discussion about the Trinity is probably going to come up. So one of the things, though, that I thought was particularly unique that I wanted to draw your attention to were cer certain phrases that the author uses. He draws out certain phrases, um, phraseological sort of um, idioms that come almost directly from the Quran. For instance, he talks about God and his word and his spirit. That is a phrasing that comes out of the Quran, and he will utilize that as a way to talk about the Trinity, the Christian theology of the Trinity. The other thing that this author does as well is he actually quotes from the Quran. So he shows a willingness to engage another sacred text and to um, see it as having some level of authority and authenticity so that he wants to utilize it in his attempt to defend a Christian theology of the Trinity uh, to others. Now, the last thing that I mentioned uh, the couple weeks ago is that that text was probably written um, primarily to encourage Christians who might have felt 
um, tempted to leave the faith and, and join the new faith that had come along, um, the, the, the tradition of Islam. So um, they may have, it, the author may have been aiming to, to talk to Muslims, but more than likely he was trying to talk to other Christians and to show them uh, that their faith had integrity, et cetera. All right. So that's number one. Uh, and then the, the, the yes, and so kind of fitting into this as well was also our discussion of the range of responses. Um, uh, I don't have listed up here on your screen, but I told you that one of the earliest real written responses that doesn't occur in the form of a letter is called the Apocalypse of Pseudo-Methodius, where Islam is interpreted in very, very negative light. So you've got a, you've got a sense of the very negative, but then I also provided for you um, a different letter actually from the Archbishop of, uh, or the, the Catholicos, the Patriarch of Seleucia Stesiphon, who talks about how um, he has found that the new Muslim leaders, not only do they not disparage Christianity, they actually show honor to it. They honor the churches, they honor the saints. So I just wanted you to see that there was a real wide range of response. Um, and I wanted you also to see the willingness to engage and even to utilize the Quran, which would of course been, you know, from a Muslim perspective in an appropriate way, but for a Christian, uh, was understood to be, to a certain extent, appropriate. They wanted to draw from this other text to show that even it sort of witnessed to where they were uh, in terms of their theology of the Trinity. So let me stop there and see if Sarah has, if there are any questions. Sarah's going to kind of mon uh, moderate questions for me, and I'll do my best to answer those as necessary. anyone has any, they can, you tell them to put it in the chat screen or read Yeah, if anybody has any, if you can put them in the chat screen, that would be helpful. How are we doing? I don't see any. All right. She's just double checking on YouTube, man. This, I'm telling you. Yep. You are. Okay. All right. We'll come back to questions later. Okay. Okay. So, uh, what I want to do next then is we're, what we're going to try to do today is we're going to complete our discussion of Christian Christianity under Islam, uh, certainly in this early period, um, as sort of a direct topic that we're engaging. And I want to wrap, wrap up our talk by talking about two figures. Uh, one man uh, uh, whom I've mentioned before, Timothy of Baghdad, and then another, the, I don't think I've mentioned at all, Theodore Abukura. And I'll just make some comments about Theodore. He's kind of the lesser of the two figures. Um, but the first one really is the one that I think I've talked about before um, with a certain amount of, um, let's see here, okay. So, uh, so Timothy of Baghdad. So this is probably a figure I would assume prior to this class, you probably have not heard of. Um, he is uh, one of the greatest of the patriarchs of the Church of the East. So he belongs uh, to the Church of the East, that tradition um, that we've been describing uh, since the uh, late fifth century. Um, by the time he becomes patriarch, uh, the, uh, the, the, the center of the church has moved from the town of Seleucia Stesiphon to the newly founded city of Baghdad. And that happens in the middle of the eighth century uh, with the rise of the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, before that, the Caliphate had centered itself in Damascus and Timothy or his predecessors would have been in a different place. He is, uh, as it says here, he is Caliph. Uh, for 43 years, which is really a remarkable, a remarkably long period uh, to be in a position of leadership. Um, and this, as you can see, it's under five different caliphs, so under five different political rulers. So even though, in a sense, the caliphs have more authority, that's uh, for sure, certainly politically, um, Timothy is going to have uh, provide more stability for his community. Uh, having that kind of duration. Uh, what can we say about his early life? Not a ton. 
Um, uh, if you remember, he's born uh, around the, the, the city of Arbella. Um, Arbella is, uh, would be located in modern day Iraq um, near the, I believe it's the Euphrates River. I can't remember exactly, but, um, but this was one of the three major centers that I talked about early on uh, for uh, the church. Um, Edessa, Arbella, and Nisibis were the first three uh, significant ones. He is uh, educated at one of the most important uh, uh, places to be educated at the time, uh, Sapsapa, uh, which is, um, uh, was an educational center uh, that the early uh, Church of the East would have uh, supported. Becomes bishop in an area around the modern city of Mosul. You've probably heard of Mosul. I would ma think maybe in the news, we've heard some of that, uh, the name of that place from time to time, um, uh, particularly during the Iraq war. And uh, while he is functioning as uh, the bishop there, he wins over the respect of the Muslim governor there. And there's some indication that they were able to have a very cooperative and good relationship. So uh, how is it then that he becomes, what are some things that we can say, uh, uh, how is it that he becomes patriarch? Well, in 778, uh, the current patriarch, the one that will precede him, uh, Hananisho II, he is going to die. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, most of the scholarship that I've been able to read indicates is, is that at this point in time, uh, the Church of the East, and in particular, uh, the hierarchy is su suffering from quite a bit of corruption. Um, and so people are bribing uh, people to have access to church positions. Eventually, now in the Western Church, this comes to be called simony. And so we, it probably would be the same thing uh, now, but that's definitely what's going on uh, during this point in time. Uh, and this is not an issue eventually, by the way, that goes away. It will stick around, even though Timothy himself tries to change this. Um, so Timothy knows that uh, you, have to, you, you have to grease the right palm, so to speak, to make things work. He kind of understands that, uh, that this is the situation he's in. And, uh, but he himself is not inclined. He, he, wants to, he wants to clean this up, but he's got to get into the position of authority to be able to clean this up. So he actually, um, he actually employs what we might think are unsavory tactics to uh, win over some key people who he needs to vote for him. And what I mean is that he sends to several key bishops large, heavy bags, presumably filled with money, right? They're supposed to go to these other bishops, and he, but he tells them, wait until after the vote, and then um, I want you to open up these bags. Now, as it turns out, um, they are not filled with gold. They are actually filled with rocks. <laughs> so... Uh, later on, instead of opening the bags and finding all this gold that they thought that they were going to get because he was bribing them, what they actually find are rocks. And uh, we have sort of a quote from him in one of his letters, someone writing to complain that, you know, he'd swindled them. He says, well, the priesthood is not to be sold for money. So he's willing effectively to utilize that situation. Uh, and again, we may have some questions about that, but such as it was. Um, his, uh, his election, even that, of course, doesn't seal um, his, his, you know, doesn't make certain that he's going to become uh, the, uh, the new Catholicos. He actually has to eventually win over another major figure, um, Isa ibn uh, Kuryash. I believe that's the correct um, pronunciation. This was the personal physician of the caliph who was himself a Christian. I think I mentioned to you when I talked about um, Christian existence under Islam, Christians actually did populate a number of very significant um, professions, one of which was medical professions. There were many, many Christians and many Jews actually who were doctors. And it was thought of as a great sort of sign of um, honor if you were a caliph and you had a Christian doctor, and that was the case here. So he was able to convince Isa uh, Ibn Kurash um, uh, of his you know, uh, um, good intentions and of the fact that he would be a good leader. And because of that, it led eventually to him being elected uh, as the bishop. 
So what can we say about him? There's a few things we can say about him as bishop. Um, and I have sort of uh, basically, I think, five things I want to point out to you um, to, as, so that you kind of can consider uh, or understand why he's so highly um, uh, celebrated. The first is that um, uh, Timothy is a very able administrator. Um, we, get, we do have uh, some texts that survive from Timothy of Baghdad, uh, one of which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But among the texts that we have are 200 different letters. Um, that show that Timothy is um, quite a diplomat. Um, he is very deft and, and able to uh, maneuver, to put his people into places where they can be effective. He works with other political entities to gain favor so that people can have safe passage. Um, all those kinds of things are kind of going on in his letters. And you, what you see is someone who, this is why he was able to be so successful over his 43 years, is that he knew how uh, uh, to do his job in terms of administration. The second thing that I think is really important, and this is gonna become important for us too, because we're gonna pivot eventually to talk about the mission into China, which begins before Timothy, but he himself remains with. And that is that he definitely is a missionary-minded uh, patriarch. Now that, I, I hope that that's not of too much surprise to you, because we have, I have mentioned to you that mission is central to the identity of the Church of the East. And particularly if we look at um, the amount of land that this church is able to uh, traverse in its uh, attempt to spread the gospel, uh, it dwarfs most other attempts prior to the modern age. Um, and I think that's something that uh, has quite a bit to teach us. So what are some things that we can say? There's a couple. So one is we, in Timothy's letters, we see him uh, uh, corresponding with churches in Tibet, uh, churches in Yemen, right, in, in southern, uh, on, the, on the southern coast of Arabia, and in northern Iran, where he is uh, appointing bishops to oversee those churches and communities and trying to attend uh, to their needs. Um, he also uh, is going to send uh, um, a bishop, and this is one of the interesting things you're going to hear about later, too when we talk particularly about the Mongolian Christianity among the Mongols, um, is that um, many bishops actually wind up having to be traveling bishops. Um, and they, they actually, there's actually a, um, a, a different category. So there's, there's a stationary bishop who would normally have oversight of a single geographical region. But then there was what comes to be called the missionary bishop, who basically has authority wherever they are. And the reason that they have to develop this is not just because of their mission work, but because one of, many of the people that these Christians are doing ministry for are nomadic. They're kind of wandering around. So as I say here, there's a Turkic king and the, the Turkic peoples are in Central Asia who requests a bishop who would travel with his people. And we have evidence that, the, that these bishops not only travel with the people, but they actually have movable sanctuaries that they travel with so that they can hold a divine liturgy um, as they move around. So very, very creative ways of trying to, to be church in those days. Um, the other thing, and I'm going to turn to this in a little bit, is uh, it is Timothy who actually um, sort of uh, blesses the Christian church in South India um, and removes them from oversight by his church. So I'm going to talk a little bit and just a little bit about the spread of Christianity into Southern uh, South Asia in India in particular. Um, and I'm going to note that for a little while they had, they were being overseen by Persian authorities. Well, it's Timothy that removes that and blesses them to become their own autonomous church. Um, he will continue to support the mission into China. Uh, and I would say as we're moving through the eighth and into the ninth century. So the time of Timothy, this is really the high watermark of the first mission into China. Um, and then uh, lastly, also connected to developments in India, Timothy is going to send down uh, St. Sabor and St. Proth, as I, and it says on your screen, Mar, and Mar is just another word for saint. These two figures, as it turns out, become very important um, because they influence the architecture of Christian churches. 
So you can actually go to India today and you can see these things called the iron or stone crosses um, of, of India. And those, I believe, some of those might even date back to this period, but those were certainly influenced in terms of their design by these two figures. Okay, so an able administrator, very missionary minded, and also a brilliant scholar, right? This, this guy uh, is something else. Um, he uh, can write in three, at least three different languages. And, and I don't just mean write a little bit. I mean, like he can write elegantly in Syriac, Greek, and Arabic. Um, and because of that, he winds up being tapped by the caliph to do some translation work. So he winds up translating one of Aristotle's uh, texts from Syriac into Arabic. And that means that Timothy is actually a part of uh, what later comes to be called the translation movement, which I think as I've told many of you, many of the texts of Plato and Aristotle and other figures like that, um, their texts are translated from Greek and Syriac into Arabic. And as that happens, it produces this thing that comes to be called the Islamic Golden Age. And then eventually that material, those materials wind up making their way back up into Europe when they're translated out of Arabic into Latin. And that happens with Thomas Aquinas and others in the 12th and 13th century. Well, Timothy's at the beginning of this whole process um, and uh, because of his own grasp uh, of the language. So let me, let me stop there for just a second and see um, if I've got some questions here, do we have any questions? I am literally a talking head. The only thing is, um, I didn't know that Mark meant saints, but Elgin and everyone else did. Oh, did so they? I was, okay. I was the only one. All right, okay. Anything else? Any other? No? Okay. Um, so this is one of the maps here that I put up on your screen that I'm going to make this available to you in a handout form, but um, you can actually find a fair number of maps um, on Google if you go into Google Image. I found this one particularly helpful because it shows you a series of things. So you can see down here the, uh, the key to the map. You can find the major patriarchal sees and then the, the places where you might have other bishops and then you have territorial provinces, but down here at the bottom is what I really liked um, because there can be places where there's not a bishop. Um, and so locations of Eastern Christians and then archeological findings. So if you look here on the coast of China, you can see on the Eastern coast of China, right? Archeological findings on the South China coast, um, Christian communities down in Canton down here, Hunan, right? Um, certainly you have major Christian presences up here in the north, and that's a story eventually that we're going to tell. But this, I think, just gives you an idea. This is, this is a map that's probably talking about the spread of the church, maybe a generation or two after Timothy has passed on. But even by Timothy's time, this is probably the region over which uh, much of which he is um, having to exert some level of authority. So you can kind of just see the reach of this tradition and it's just very, very impressive. Let's see, are there any questions on this map? All right, sounds like we're doing good. Okay, so let's move forward. Um, yeah, like, well, silence in here is just, it's almost deafening. Every now and then Jeff will laugh, which is good. Um, so let's turn this. So the last thing I want to talk about, there's just two final things I want to mention about Timothy. One is uh, a little more of a kind of refined thing that I don't know, maybe esoteric. Uh, but Timothy, um, in, in his 40th letter of out of the 200, it's called letter 40, um, he is seen in this letter he sort of, um, he recounts a debate that he has with a Muslim cleric, a Muslim scholar. And in this discussion that he has with the Muslim scholar, he explains the use of Aristotelian logic for the basis of an argument. 
And there are a number of scholars who have argued that Timothy's discussion here in letter 40 actually makes a contribution to later forms of Islamic theology, that eventually Islam is going to take up um, Aristotelian logic, Aristotelian uh, rhetoric, et cetera, as it develops what it comes to call Kalam. Kalam is a way of talking about Islamic theology. And so it's just very fascinating to think about the fact or the possibility that uh, a, there's a Christian who makes a constructive contribution to later discourse uh, in Islam. And that's in, uh, as I so uh, tell you in a, a letter for you. Yeah, question. What does seize? -E S. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, those refer to the seat. It's literally uh, a shorthand for seat or throne, right? So the patriarchal seat, C, is a way of talking about their location of authority and then the geographical region that they would have uh, say over. Is that helpful? Okay. Other questions? This is great, I love getting questions. Anything? Okay, all right. Okay, so that's the, there's four things that I've talked to. The very last one, which is the one that I think is probably the most uh, kind of interesting one in some ways, is the fact that Timothy, um, relatively early on in his um, uh, role as patriarch, is invited into a two-day debate with the Caliph al-Mahdi, which happens either in 781 or 782. So, and there are gonna be a couple of opportunities, I think, as we move through our time together where I can tell you about some interreligious debates that actually happen in the ancient world. And they were very rare, uh, but when they, so when they do happen, it's worth your while to kind of take notice. Uh, yeah, looks like I got a hand up here again. We have an issues with volume. Uh, Dr. Salt, do you have a question? I muted you. Oh, wait, you muted yourself. Wait, give me a second. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Um, Jeff, just a second, give me a second, you and I, I think, are probably going to be talking about how to do it. Um, Jeff, wait a second. It's a little more difficult. Let me see here. I don't think I can. I don't think I can. Can you hear me now, Sarah? Yeah. Our, our screens are telling us you have muted us and we can't unmute ourselves. That's why you're not hearing anything. Oh, yes. They're back. They're... Go ahead, Jeff. Did you have a question? No, I'm just trying to let you know why you're not hearing anything. Uh, you can a question. Elgin's got a question. No, you can chat a question. Oh yeah, that's that would be better, I think, if you chatted a question. We're all doing. Okay. All right. So let's go. Let's let me kind of move us forward. Um, so basically. A debate with one another yeah okay the major topics that christians and muslims are going to debate, to debate today were being debated all the way back then so the trinity the uh reliability of scripture um the questions about uh mission or the resurrection of jesus the legitimacy of muhammad etc all of that stuff is being discussed and debated 
in this early these early texts um and it's just absolutely fascinating um it winds up so it winds up being published and it is it becomes very very popular certainly for christians who are living in muslim lands but from what scholars are saying it also becomes popular among muslims in part because uh, Muslims feel like the way that Timothy writes everything, he does justice to their position. So they sort of feel like they're actually being heard and there's a kind of interesting back and forth uh, that goes on. So as, and I, as I've listed here, uh, several uh, of the topics that are discussed, the doctrine of the Trinity, incarnation, status of Muhammad, integrity of Christian scripture, certain Christian practices, et cetera. In just a second, I'm gonna give you a little brief like taste of what this actually sounds like. But I've, excuse me, I've got a question in the audience over here. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, it's just a question a lot actually. Yeah. But what specifically, as far as Aristotelian logic is discussed, why is that important that it's in God's word? That's a great question. <laughs> so the question is what specifically of Aristotelian logic is discussed and why is that important? The former question I can't answer off the top of my head right now. Um, the latter, except to say in vague generalities that uh, Aristotelian logic has to do with um, uh, justifying your answers in a certain kind of way, which Aristotle himself sets up um, according to the rules of logic uh, for Aristotle. Now, I can't exactly say precisely what it is, uh, that that refers to in terms of Timothy's letter. But what I can say is that it is effectively Timothy then who is mediating the use of logic in an argument to a Muslim scholar who, and eventually that same kind of argument, we're gonna utilize logic as the basis for our arguments. That's gonna become a very significant component later on of Islamic theology. So that's kind of the point uh, that a number of scholars make. Let me stop there. I think it looks like I've got another hand here. Yeah. Right. That's right. I was just going to note that I think it's interesting. That's interesting given how then it's. Um, it's in the Muslim world, where as you get to the time of Aquinas in the 12th century, how then it's, um, it's both, this thread of Aristotelian logic gets both internalized and interpreted inside of Islam and gets brought back to the West and, and in the new um, Catholic scholastic movement in the 12th century. Right. So just to say, it's interesting that the Aristotelian goes into Islam and then it, it ends up being translated and traversed back to influence dark ages in the West. Yeah, yeah. So, so Sarah was making the point that she thought it was interesting that um, it is uh, the way that Aristotle, in a sense, travels uh, because we might think about Aristotle as, as part of the inheritance of the West. What we mean by West, of course, is an open question, but it's pretty clear when we look historically that first Aristotle goes East right, his t the texts of Aristotle, the ones that become important eventually, say, for instance, in Latin speaking uh, Christianity in say Europe, has to go through Arabic translations and Arabic commentary, and then eventually that's gonna make its way back as it's gonna be translated out of Arabic into Latin for people like Aquinas and others when logic is gonna become at the very center of the way that they uh, do their theology, um, making a logical argument um, is going to become very, very important for um, Western uh, Catholic thinking in the 13th and 14th century. That's right. So uh, without, without uh, unfortunately, I, can't, I don't have much more to offer to you in terms of that right now. Um, let me, though, give you a little taste here. Uh, this is a passage from the, the uh, dialogue and the debate between uh, Timothy and Almadi. And I'll just read the text out here. Our gracious and wise king said to me, what do you say about Muhammad? And I replied to his majesty, Muhammad is worthy of all praise by all reasonable people, O oh my sovereign. He walked in the path of the prophets and trod in the track of the lovers of God. 
All the prophets taught the doctrine of the one God, and since Muhammad taught the doctrine of the unity of God, he walked therefore in the path of the prophets. Further, all the prophets drove men away from bad works and brought them nearer to good works. And since Muhammad drove his people away from bad works and brought them nearer to good works, he walked therefore in the path of the prophets. Finally, Muhammad taught about God, his word and his spirit. And since all the prophets had prophesied about God, his word and his spirit, Muhammad walked therefore in the path of all the prophets. And our king said to me, you should therefore accept the words of the prophet. And I replied to his gracious majesty, which words of our gracious victorious king, which words of his our gracious or victorious king believes that I must accept? And our king said to me that God is one and that there is no other besides him. And I replied, this belief in one God, O my sovereign, I have learned from the Torah, from the prophets and from the gospel. I stand by it and shall die in it. And our victorious king said to me, you believe in one God, as you said, but one in three. And I answered his sentence, I do not deny that I believe in one God in three and three in one, but not in three different Godheads. However, but in the persons of God's word and his spirit. So I want to stop there just for a second. There is so much rich and interesting stuff going on uh, just in this passage. One thing is the sort of graciousness with which and the ability of Timothy to see in Muhammad and in the tradition that Muhammad gives birth to that there are areas of over, overlap with his Christian faith and certainly with his Jewish faith. One of those is Muhammad's um, critique of polytheism and paganism. So that's what he's referring to when he says that he taught the unity of God, that there was one God and not a bunch of others. The other is the intense commitment to doing good works, right? Care for the poor, those kinds of things. This is another place where Timothy sees overlap. The last thing that we see in this first paragraph is Timothy sneaking in a, uh, and this is a, an argument that we find in a bunch of other Christian authors, but he's sneaking in the idea that Muhammad also taught about the Trinity because the passage says Muhammad taught about God, his word, and his spirit. And that's a, that's a trend that for, for not for Muhammad and not for Islam, but for Timothy and Christian writers using Arabic, that is an attempt to appropriate some of the language out of the Quran to make an argument that even the Quran, maybe perhaps despite itself, still witnesses to a triune God. So this is Timothy sort of pushing back. So we have both dialogue and dispute going on. And then you see the same thing happening in the second paragraph where he says, of course, I believe in only one God. And the king says, well, babe, but you say you believe one in three. And he's like, yes, I believe in one in three, but that doesn't mean I believe in three gods. So if you read through some of this, uh, and I've, I made available this, this primary source, or at least excerpts of it for you, I could also repost it again. I think you will find it absolutely fascinating in part, not just because of the content, but just the modeling that we get from Timothy about how to interact with our interreligious neighbors, people who have other belief systems. Maybe they don't even have a belief system, but are there ways that we can be gracious and open and kind of welcoming of others? So let me stop there. I think I've got a question or two. Yeah. So it sounds like I have two questions. Um, was the view of the Trinity settled? What was it? Like at this time, it sounds like the view of the Trinity is different in the West versus the East. So, in the so so, the first question is: um, is the is are is the Christian view of the Trinity by this point in time settled? And is there a difference between West and East? The answer to the first question is yes. It's effectively settled. Uh, the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople happened in 325 and 381, which is about three or 400 years prior to this event. The Nicene Creed has been created and promulgated. Almost all churches have embraced it. The answer to the second question is also that there is no difference between East and West in terms of the uh, embracing of the Trinity. One of the things, so uh, as I talk to you about this tradition and the differences around uh, Christology around Jesus and the and, you know the debates about the Chalcedonian definition. 
Yes, there is a difference there, but there is no difference around the Nicene Creed. These churches all embrace the Nicene Creed and therefore they all embrace the Trinity. Anything else? Yeah, I'll have to, so the second question is another question about Aristotle's logic, and I'll have to uh, set that aside for now and come back maybe to that later. Um, whoever's asking that Aristotle's logic question, I'm going to do my homework and be ready for you next week. All right, John Holden, I'm sending you an email. Um, okay, so let me, uh, we're going to run out of time here. I think what I'd like to do, if everybody's okay with this, is I want to skip over uh, discussion of Theodore Abukura, and uh, so that we can kind of get into. The, my colleagues are laughing their heads off because they're like Theodore who? Gonna yeah, I'm gonna skip over Theodore Abukura, um, uh, in part because I want to tell you a little bit of the story of how Christianity gets into into India, so that next week we can really start talking about um, the mission into China. So if you will just bear with me for one moment. I'm gonna skip. Is it straight up? To, should we stop? It's straight up twelve. So I am getting instructions that it might be time to straight up stop. So let me give you a little teaser then, yeah, for next week, um, uh, which is um, here's the teaser. There are several different stories about how Christianity makes its way into India. Um, and I'm going to share all those with you. Uh, we're going to share some legendary stories, some stories of tradition, and then we're going to share some historical data. And then we are going to turn and talk about how Christianity first enters China, um, probably close to 600 years prior to what anyone uh, used to think was the case. Uh, so with that, I'm going to kind of bring our time to an end. I hope that this was of help to you. Um, if you have any comments, you can certainly feel free to send me an email. Um, thank you so much for your patience and for your willingness to engage. Uh, and let me just close this in a quick word of prayer, a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for this day. We thank you for the gift that you give to us of study and thought, um, the opportunity that we have in such a strange and unique time to also still gather, uh, to learn together. Uh, I pray uh, that you are with my brothers and sisters, however far or near they may be, that you will empower them and encourage them. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Go in peace, brothers and sisters. Jeff was texting.